Hello, I'm Richard Hara, and this is Social Impact Live, a weekly conversation with members of the Columbia School of Social Work community. On our program today, we'll be talking about the health needs of Native and Indigenous people with our guests, Ariel Richer and Sutton King, who lead the Urban Indigenous Collective, <clears throat> a nonprofit for urban Natives by urban Natives. What are the specific health needs? Why aren't they being met? And what needs to be done? Ariel and Sutton, thank you for stopping by to our program today. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Um, we'll be talking about the specific health needs and um, the nonprofit that you're working with and actually founded. Um, but before we do that, I wonder if you could just share a little bit about how you came to be involved with these issues in the first place. Is there a personal connection? Um, how did it all come about? Absolutely. So first I just want to say Poso, Sokoli, Satan King, Nukyat, and Gwahewe Ni'i, Waknyata, Nawagito Ota, Oniota Aga Ni'i. So I said, uh, my name is Sutton. Um, my name in Menominee is Naktao Pianuki, comes first woman. And so I'm both, I'm Menominee Oneida. I'm turtle clan of the Oneida Nation of mm. Wisconsin. Um, I'm Afro-Indigenous. Um, and so this work is, you know, the genesis of me. You know, I say if I was a tree, uh, my first core of that, that ring would be my uh, indigeneity. Mm -hmm. So um, coming from Wisconsin, moving to New York City at 18, um, it's just always been my passion to kind of help bridge the gap of health inequalities that exist for urban natives, mm -hmm. um, especially in the tri-state area. Um, I think we see that uh, a lot of the eastern tribes in, in New York City and along the, the eastern seaboard have been impacted by colonialism, the first to be impacted by colonialism. Mm -hmm. However, we see a lack of resources, and they seem to be the last to get the resources they need to uh, create the healing that they mm -hmm. deserve. And so that's kind of uh, been my life mission here. Okay, thank you. Ariel? I came to this work, well, I've always been involved with um, gender-based violence, mm. um, probably since I was about 18. Um, and from there, you know, there's a lot of uh, comorbidities and overlap of mental health needs, um, also substance use. So I came to Columbia about seven years ago for my MSW, yeah. um, <laughs> which uh, was a great experience. And then from there, I moved to D.C. and I was working with the Administration for Native Americans. I was working in program evaluation. So I had this wonderful opportunity to kind of get this broad survey about what was happening in, in Indian country, mm -hmm. um, funding different uh, community-based um, initiatives. And then from there, I was also involved in community organizing around um, uh, environmental concerns. And then it wasn't until after that that I actually found out that I'm also indigenous. My mom's said, you know, I remember hearing my grandma speaking really? our indigenous language. Um, mm. So she's from Venezuela and Trinidad. Mm. Um, so the work that I was already invested in um, because of the friends that I had made uh, took an, a different personal touch for me between mm -hmm. the, the gender-based violence, the mental health and the substance use and, and environmental because actually all those parts really do come together mm -hmm. um, and, and all have similar meaning. Great. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for sharing that personal background. Yeah. Um, before I ask my first question, I just want to remind our viewers that we save the last 10 minutes for Q&A. So if you've got a question, please write it in. Um, there's a, a place on Facebook where you can uh, submit a question, and we'll turn it over to our guests um, at the end of the program. So thanks very much. Um, mentioned urban native. How do you define urban native, and why is that important? Absolutely. Mm. So, you know, UIC has created their own definition of what okay. an urban native is. And so if you look at the federal definition, it's not inclusive at all. Um, essentially, they want you to have a certificate of blood. Uh, they want to, sh you know, right. need to show your blood quantum. You know, mm. uh, natives are the only ethnicity besides uh, horses and dogs who have to actually <laughs> uh, provide their blood quantum and, and mm. you know, to be able to be enrolled into their tribe yeah. or prove descendancy. And so um, the definition for urban uh, natives uh, 
provided by UIC is um, being indigenous of the Western Hemisphere, mm -hmm. so uh, North America, Central America, South America, um, the Pacific Islands as well, and the Caribbeans, um, and, and living in a metro area mm -hmm. as well. Um, so again, being someone who worked at an urban Indian health program, I was a director for over a year here in oh, New York okay. City, yeah. um, it was very hard to have our relatives, our indigenous relatives, come through the door and uh, say, you know, I'm sorry, we can't serve you. You can't prove your descendancy mm. or you can't prove that you're indigenous. Mm -hmm. Okay, we hear what you, you know, your family lineage has, has said, but mm. um, because you don't have this documentation, this paper, uh, you're not welcome here. Well. And, and that was very disheartening for me. And so that's why at uh, UIC, we want to make sure we're being inclusive in our definition mm -hmm. um, and we don't want to uh, subscribe to this federal definition of what makes you an urban native. Mm. Okay. About 70% of Native people in the U.S. right now actually don't live on a reservation. And right. uh, that comes as a surprise to many people. Mm -hmm. uh, when we talk about the work that we do, the first thing they say is, oh, I, I saw this reservation once. It's like, mm. that's interesting. <laughs> um, and then I try to be patient and let them know that 70% of us don't live on or near a reservation or trust land, mm. um, but we live in urban areas. Mm -hmm. uh, further, only 25% of these urban areas have... Uh, are served by a an urban Indian health center. Okay, um, right, right now, right. the closest ones are Baltimore and Boston, which is not helpful if you're living in New York City because New York City has the most really? natives of any other. You'd have to go to area. Baltimore well, or Boston to so, get that kind of health care. Right. So you do have an urban program here in New York City. Okay. However, it's only outreach and referral. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking for provider care, right. you're not going to get that. Wow. And so that was another part of, you know, directing that program that was hard because, you know, we're saying come in, here's a safe space, but we're telling you to leave at the same right. time, you know. And so it was very, you know, um, difficult to have people come in who wanted to be treated mm -hmm. by the program mm -hmm. and were weren't able to receive that care. And that's really when uh, myself and Jared Packard, who was also at the Urban Indian Health Program and now is with UIC, um, really identified these, you know, these gaps yeah. of services and decided, yeah. you know what, if we're not going to get funded to be able to provide these services that are so needed. And again, these are things we were hearing a lot of our Indigenous relatives say, you know, mm. I want to see a mental health therapist. Yeah. I want somebody who's Indigenous, yeah. somebody who understands my background, my origin. Mm -hmm. um, and so we weren't giving getting the support that we needed to make that happen yeah. so we decided let's do it ourselves well I you know it's it's you know not surprising then um, given what you've told us uh, that uh, there are all of these these disparities right Absolutely. and lack of uh, access to care and so on I was looking at this community health profile for New York service area put out by the Urban Indian Health Institute mm -hmm. right and I know you're familiar with this uh, information but uh, Compared to non-Hispanic whites, urban uh, American Indian Alaska natives, right, in these counties are two and a half times more likely to not have health insurance, nice. four times as likely to participate in food assistance programs, nearly twice as likely to be diagnosed with gestational diabetes, um, twice as likely to receive late or no prenatal care, uh, and so on. So this is just a slice, but Absolutely. I mean, across the board, we're talking about basic health care, um, and also mental health care as well, because I don't see anything here about that in this report. Absolutely. And that's something that we're focusing on right now as we've been implementing a community health needs assessment to really be able to understand the health priorities, mental health priorities in particular, mm -hmm. um, of our community. Um, and I think that, you know, that's something that Ariel can speak to more. Um, but the first time we were actually able to implement that survey was Indigenous Peoples Day, and we had just an amazing turnout. And so many of our community members said, this is what we want to see. Mm -hmm. You know, we want providers. Um, and so they're really excited to, to take the survey, to participate. Mm -hmm. Um, so UIC has embarked on this wonderful community health needs assessment. Uh, there's, it's multi-part, um, like Sutton said. On Indigenous Peoples Day in October, we started off with the survey portion of it, which will run for about a year um, for the, the first wave of it. Um, and then we're also implementing a series of community health uh, forums. Mm -hmm. Uh, the first one is in two weeks, actually. March 14th. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> we've invited um, uh, Indigenous and Native community members. Um, we will be doing a series of um, focus groups and some key stakeholder interviews mm -hmm. to really understand what the, not just the mental health needs, but the priorities and um, just get an understanding for the types of services that we hope to provide in the very near future. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, you know, and I think that a lot of times you have nonprofits come into the space and, you know, they they create programming without consulting the community. And uh, we, we, we uh, view um, consult, consultation as, as protocol here. And I think that is the native way and the indigenous way to make sure that um, programming is built in community voice. Mm -hmm. And so we don't want to look at this data that's based on 2010 census data and say, okay, right. this is what we're going to provide you. And like you said, there's a lack of data surrounding the mental health portion, we want to understand this. And so, um, yes, uh, implementing the survey to have that quantitative aspect, but also the forum so that we were really hearing what our community uh, wants. So, yeah. so uh, my understanding is that um, you and two others uh, started this Urban Indigenous Collective. Um, it's fairly recent. Yes. Um, so you're putting together programming and, and so on. Uh, but at the same time, you're both students, right? <laughs> yes, you're working towards correct. your master's in public health That's correct. at NYU and you towards your um, doctorate here uh, in social work at right. the Columbia School of Social Work. So, I mean, so does your academic background inform what you're doing in this organization? And, 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 and so what's the interplay there? Absolutely. So for myself, it it obviously does inform the, the work that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also very cognizant of a history of this very extractive research of non-Indigenous and sometimes even Indigenous researchers going into communities and, and taking the information, mm -hmm. um, not consulting with the community and not um, giving them any say in what is put forth and what is published and how, how the information is used. So that is something that's really important to us as we move forward on this research track, um, so it's informed by Western ways of knowing, but it's also um, mm -hmm. bolstered and informed by indigenous ways of knowing um, and doing research, as we say, in a good way. Right. Uh, making So we have a community um, advisory board mm -hmm. uh, who, who we've been working with to develop the different community forum questions and making sure that, you know, we are reaching out to the, mm -hmm. the, to the correct people and that we're doing things um, with c uh, consistent and um, continuous consultation throughout the way. Um, okay. I actually wouldn't have met Sun without my advisor, mm -hmm. Dr. Louisa Gilbert, oh. whom I've learned so much from, mm -hmm. um, but I'm really thankful that I met Sun and that we are able to move forward in, in our research as well, and I'm really supported through that. Absolutely, and, and yeah, and so that introduction was made by a uh, mentor and boss to me at the time, Jennifer Spiegler, um, who's over at Cognito, and so um, at that time, I was actually working with Cognito uh, Indian Country Child Trauma Center that's out of Oklahoma University hmm. and OJJDP and mm -hmm. what we did together was develop the first culturally tailored uh, simulation that taught law enforcement how to engage with tribal youth without re-traumatizing them. Oh. So actually uh, going into this simulation, choosing what you want to say to this youth, mm -hmm. and depending on what you say, you get a response like a, a real human. And mm -hmm. so um, by teaching the officers uh, historical trauma, intergenerational trauma, uh, sharing information about the ACE study and, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the adverse reactions that may happen in an encounter mm -hmm. and how to have those conversations to avoid uh, arrest and, and get that youth to the help they need. So um, could you give me an example of something that you would tell law enforcement, I mean, to do or to say that would sort of ease or make that connection? Connection Absolutely. To youth. Yeah. yeah, and so um, in particular in this scenario, um, a police officer was called to a powwow where they had a report of a youth who stole uh, a t-shirt. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had a description, a youth with a uh, basketball logo on the shirt. Mm -hmm. And so you go into the simulation and you walk up to this youth and then you choose what you want to say, almost like a build your own adventure book, if you can remember those. And so um, basically what we, you know, you the law enforcement has a choice, you know, so you can say, hey, stop there, what's your name? Mm -hmm. Or you can say, hey, my name is Officer Harjo. Um, I'd like to talk to you for a second. Mm -hmm. Hey, what's your name? You know, and, and depending on what you choose, you have a, a real-time um, person who will come up and tell you, you know, that that was not helpful, this was helpful, this is why you shouldn't do this. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes you have to start over and, and do it again and practice, and I saw it a lot, especially through the piloting. Right. Um, but learning how to connect with the youth, being gentle, and mm -hmm. not saying, hey, put your hands up, mm -hmm. what's in the bag? Mm -hmm. um, and so we found Given really their past history and of 
Right. They Absolutely. Start with, sure. You know, and what's your name? Jacob Big Bear. Oh, I know your father. Senior, mm. you know, Big Bear Senior. You know, making those personal co connections. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was a really amazing to see. We implement, implemented that in over 80 tribes, mm -hmm. uh, along with suicide prevention programming as mm -hmm. well. Um, but that's kind of how I met Jennifer and then how that uh, introduction was made. And then by that time, I had moved over to the Urban Indian Health Program. Okay, so, so doing work that really tries to uh, adapt uh, interventions and so on, given a particular cultural background or context. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and currently, I'm working under um, uh, my mentor that's at University of New Mexico, and uh, she's Danae, Dr. Crystal Lee. Mm -hmm. And so we're actually funded by Gilead to look at the acceptability um, and, and knowledge of biomedical interventions, uh, PEP and PrEP, in Native yeah. American college students. Okay. And so this is the first time that this has ever happened, which is great, but I'm like, okay, so it's 2020, mm -hmm. you know, why aren't we looking Looking at the, you know, the cultural acceptability of these um, these interventions, which are so important when we know um, the STI rates uh, in natives, this is a, just a high prevalence of this. Okay. Um, and so this is something that we've been working on and just developed our, our survey. So. So. Mm -hmm. So you're you're collecting information, and is this an example of the health needs that you're really focusing on in this population? Um, you know, through your work with the Urban Indigenous Collective. I think with Urban Indigenous Collective, our first, our first area that we'd like to look at is specifically mental health, mental health, uh, mental health and yeah. substance use right. um, as well, uh, just because there are some very specific needs, uh, as Sutton mentioned, there's, mm. there's a history of historical trauma and intergenerational trauma. There's a shared loss of language, land, culture mm -hmm. um, that all informs the ways that we respond to different interventions mm -hmm. and the way that we um, need interventions that are tailored for us and not just tailored for us but also specifically created for us so mm -hmm. that's I think that's our eventual goal um, mm -hmm. we wanted to start off with talking circles I think maybe let you talk a little bit about that yeah mm -hmm. and so that's something that we'd like to see um, to be able to provide that safe space for urban natives, you know, mm -hmm. we've got a lot of different natives that come in, uh, whether that's in university or just looking for, you know, work. And we want to make sure that there is a safe space. Again, we haven't seen any culturally tailored um, mental health um, services for natives in New York City or really the tri-state area. Um, and so we want to be able to provide that, again, like Ariel mentioned, with over a population of over 100,000 we'd like to see at least one safe space for <laughs> urban natives. Um, so we're, we're working on building that. And so again, it's really in its infancy, but we hope to make sure that with the data we're collecting, we're able to tailor the programming that mm. really truly fits the needs. Yeah, so um, trying not to impose a framework on the talking circle from my perspective and saying, well, is it therapeutic or is it? So what do the people who participate in these talking circles see as its benefit and value? Right. So currently we have not started the talking circle mm. with UIC. However, I can talk about historically what yeah. I've seen yeah. um, uh, at the Urban Indian Health Program. And, and for, for a lot of the urban natives, it's, it's very healing. It um, helps them feel more connected to home mm -hmm. and to also share that space with other, other urban natives who okay. understand the unique challenges that we face in this concrete jungle. Mm. Um, and so I think that um, just uh, that non-familial connectedness that a lot of us lack. Again, you know, I'm from Wisconsin. My family is over 750 miles away and Ariel from Seattle. I mean, mm. <laughs> I don't know how many miles that is, but 3, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we're, you know, really far from home. And so yeah. another thing I always say is that UIC isn't just a team. Um, we're really a family, mm. you know, and it's so important to be able to connect with other urban natives in mm. the space. And something else that we're working on is an app. And, and so we'd like to, to push that forward too, to make sure that uh, when you come to a, a big city and you feel alone, you can you can connect and you can have that, you know, social support mm -hmm. that's needed in, in a city like New York City. <laughs> yeah. So you, you're you're doing uh, more indigenous led research. You're thinking about program that you can start developing right. um, through the urban indigenous collective and so on. So it's very exciting to sort of be here at the moment, right? Where Real all of time. this comes together <laughs> um, and so on. So um, so looking at you know the the health needs of uh, native and indigenous peoples, and I mean, we have some sense of uh, historically what's led to these disparities in care and so on outcomes, things like that. But um, if you had a wish list of things that you would like to see out there available, I mean, what would that look like for this population? 
I would love to see a culturally tailored ambulatory care clinic mm. for urban natives. Yeah. I mean, that is that is my dream. Um, and I believe that New York City and the urban natives living here deserve that. You mm. know, you have such a great standard when you look at the Seattle Indian Health Board and on the West Coast. And why haven't uh, the natives here on the East Coast mm. uh, been able to, to have something to support them in that way? The first to be impacted you, yeah. by colonialism. The last to receive the resources it's, needed to restore healing. What's the explanation for that? Do there you is, have one? There is no explanation for that. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think about <laughs> yeah. what my wish is. <laughs> I think I think I would be. I'd, I'm just excited to see programming that every urban native and indigenous person here knows that they they have a place to go that mm. they that they won't have to ask four or five six people where can I get care where can I get help right. um, and knowing that it's a safe trusted place that. Um, someone isn't going to say something racist, whether it's on purpose or by accident, but then mm. they can go somewhere and not have to deal with these other barriers, but mm. they can go there and, and receive the care that they need okay. um, and have this overwhelming support. Right. I'm very excited. For well, I think uh, we can look forward to seeing you two and your group working <laughs> on, on making this a reality. So um, if we could turn to some questions here. I have a question for both speakers, which may sound basic, but I genuinely want to know, what is the distinction between the terms native, indigenous, and Indian? So, so the reason that we have chosen indigenous is because mm. it means first peoples. So um, it is a little bit of a, a regional thing that different parts of the world, uh, people use some different terms, uh, but that's why we've adopted the term indigenous okay. for our group. Um, Native, I think I may let you touch on. Yeah, native. and and so, um, me personally, I I prefer to be uh, referred to as native versus Indian. I think that this is misconception when Columbus came and he thought he was in India, and uh, <laughs> yeah, no, not Indian, okay. Native American. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's kind of interchangeable when we use native or indigenous. Um, however, we like to move away from the term Indian. <laughs> yes. Mm, yeah, um, I and I don't know if this is relevant, but also you've got. Uh, connotations to all of these terms and and I think that with native sometimes there's a little bit of romanticism as well that kind of masks the actual history right. um, so I mean it's 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 very complicated and, and probably depends on the context when you're using these terms right. you know um, what sorts of meanings people take away uh, from them so um, good question uh, are there any efforts to provide training, like you mentioned, to NYPD cops? And so, actually, during my time at mm. Cognito, this was something I really was trying to implement within New York City. However, uh, there was really um, no uh, feedback when mm. I would reach out. Um, so, unfortunately, uh, that training was never implemented here in New York City. Um, more in other urban cities, um, more along the, uh, the Southwest, Phoenix, mm -hmm. um, but more so on reservations. We had a lot of tribal uh, police departments mm. who wanted to take this and took the initiative. Mm. Um, however, I'd like to see this, uh, you know, within the NYPD and in more urban spaces where, again, most of us are. Okay. So, All right. um, How can those of us who are not part of the indigenous community help to support UIC's mission? Okay, good question. It's a great question. Um, well, the first one, this is a shameless plug, you can <laughs> donate. Um, we, I mean, we're at the, we're at the beginnings of this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we are actively pursuing different grants um, and different funding sources. Um, but then also, I think, just becoming educated and, and asking questions, yes. um, like, like the question about the, the words to use. Like, that's the way that we learn and figure out how to interact with different people in different spaces. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one one way to support us. Absolutely, and, and there's resources on our website. If you want to learn more and educate yourself, you know, we, we always update uh, that resources page under research um, so that you do have the facts and, and the knowledge. Um, and we invite you to come out. Um, we have different events. Um, we are having our first community forum on March 14th, and that information's on our website and our social media platforms. Um, but we invite you to experience our culture and understand the needs um, and ask questions and educate yourself. Mm. I, I know we have some more questions, but I want to go back to just this whole thing about you just launching your own nonprofit <laughs> and so right. on, which I think is so exciting and 
speaks to what I think a lot of our students envision for themselves in the future when they come here to the School of Social Work, that um, you know, they'll have that kind of opportunity. And so I'm just curious if, if briefly you could tell me, how did this happen? It, it, did you just sort of like said one day, hey, we'll just you know, incorporate it. Right. I mean, how did it come about? It's always been a dream of mine. Yeah. And um, you don't choose this work. It chooses you. Mm. Um, and so I always knew that one day this would come into fruition. Mm -hmm. I didn't know exactly how, where, or when, but I knew it would. Um, and working at the Urban Indian Health Program here in New York City, okay. that's what really opened my eyes. Um, and really understanding that the urban programs here in New York City have historically struggled. Um, and so wanting to make sure that that gap was filled. And so um, while I'm meeting other people, other urban natives, I'm hearing the same passion mm -hmm. and I'm thinking, okay, Let's connect all of these individuals mm -hmm. and, and, and put this, this dream into fruition, plant mm -hmm. these seeds. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I'm so blessed to have Ariel as a colleague and Noel and Jared, who all also believed in this vision mm -hmm. um, because it was kind of like leading them into the dark and they trusted me <laughs> yes. and I said, we can do this, I see it, you know. Mm -hmm. And so again, I, I left uh, my position as director in June um, and by August uh, we had incorporated and now we are 501c3. And so it's just, it's happening and it wouldn't happen without uh, um, our amazing team. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to add to that? Or? I think, really, you just kind of have to keep moving forward. Yeah. And we we have a, a lot of really great mentors mm. and people yeah. who've kind of done some of this work before. We have a great advisory, uh, community advisory board. But we also have a great um, board of directors. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of people supporting us and, mm -hmm. and who believe in us and what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't... Right. I mean, it doesn't hurt that all of us are very, very driven individuals. Mm -hmm. um, I also want to point out that Noelle is also a CSSW alumna. Oh, yes, she graduated she is. the year after I did in 2016. Oh, okay. So three out of the four of us are students, are graduate students, yeah. oh, and yes. she's working full time. Yes. So. And, um, and were you able to sort of tap into resources through the School of Social Work to help or, um, you know, with the logistics of, of setting up a, a nonprofit? Not necessarily on the logistics and yeah. setting up the nonprofit. Um, I didn't really know who to reach out to so who, for, who for did that. You, yeah. um, how did we move forward? <laughs> well, well, for me, you know, uh, there was a lot of resources at NYU. Okay. And so I was in the health management and policy course while mm. this was coming into fruition. And so I was using a lot of the, the resources that were given to, given to me in class mm. to actually create this business plan, to look at the model, um, to better understand how you create an infrastructure of sustainability okay. when you're looking at building a nonprofit. And mm. so that was what was really helpful for me. And I've used all my research here mm -hmm. to support our research plan moving forward. Mm -hmm. So I'm working with the IRB office right now okay. um, right. because we decided that we we want to be able to capture how we are building and developing this this organization because mm. um, I feel like there's such a lack of that in implementation science. Right. Um, we like there's very, very small sections about, oh, how this was done, how we connected with the community. I was like, I want an entire manuscript about how you um, reach out to communities, mm. how you have conversations, how it's very, very slow. It's, right. it's not a fast process <laughs> right. at all. Yeah. You yeah. read it in a manuscript, you're like, yeah. oh, that's very quick, but that's not at all how it is. Yeah. Um, I was, I felt like there was such a gap in the nuts and bolts of actually building a community and doing community-based right. research. There's mm -hmm. a lot of of talk about it, yeah. but not the how-to. Yeah. Right, right, and showing how you practice, you know, consultation as protocol. That's something that's very important to us and, mm -hmm. you know, the foundation of our work. Well, if we have time, I'll come back to the research question, maybe yeah. what you're doing individually, but I just want to check um, some more uh, audience questions. Would you speak to the importance and effect of a full and complete count for the 2020 census? What kinds of services could that help to provide? Is that a push? Is that a need? Um, I, I, it's an absolute need to, yeah. be, to be fully counted. Um, I think that many Native and Indigenous people, people don't even realize that we're here. Something mm. that we say a lot yeah. is that we're still here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're not a relic of the past. We're not an artifact. Um, mm. But we're we have very real needs and and we're very contemporary. We're not just we're not living in the past. People have this. I don't know, archetype of us. Mm. Um, so I think it'd be very important to be one fully counted so that we have access to the services that we need, that we won't just be considered, oh, well, you're just an asterisk, you're just a very small mm. percentage of the population. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it will show a full force of, of how many we are. Mm -hmm. Right. 
I would agree. I would yeah. agree. And again, you know, a lot of the programming that we see now is based off 2010 census data that we know is desegregated, that we know is just not accurate, mm -hmm. you know. And so having a complete count is so important when we're talking about uh, funding, mm -hmm. you know, and program development. And again, uh, the resources are so badly needed here in the tri-state area. Yeah. Well, I know it's been said before, but we really need the numbers for now. I mean, we do. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, people's image and my image of Native Americans in New York is sort of related to this kind of urban myth about how they built the skyscrapers and things like that. But that's what, you know, from the 30s or something like that, uh, what's happening now and what are the, the current needs, right, that need to be addressed. Absolutely. So, last audience question. Are you finding some of the grants you're pursuing to define native, quote unquote, in specific blood quantums or other identifications you find restrictive? Is that still a, a kind of um, problem? When you look at federal funding, mm. you'll see that particularly with Indian Health Service. Um, and if you are accepting uh, funds from IHS, um, then you are going to have to subscribe to the federal definition of urban native. Mm. However, that's something that we're striving to move away from so that we are able to welcome all of our indigenous relatives in, in our door and in mm -hmm. our safe space. Um, so we're looking at a lot of different philanthropy funding. Yeah. Um, and so that's a little bit more broader in definition. Um, but that federal funding will definitely, um, is not as inclusive as it should be. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you want those federal dollars, but yeah. at the same time, you've got to meet all of those requirements and restrictions and document and everything else. So um, it's a trade off. And if you can find other alternate sources right. of funding, obviously, that's that's very helpful. So, um, well, let's see. Uh, I think that concludes today's episode. Um, so. Thank you, Ariel and Sutton, for joining us here today on Social Impact Live. It's been great having been you. Great. And Thank congratulations you. on your work with the Urban Indigenous Collective. Thank, Thank you. you so Thank much. you. Thank you all. Um, we'll be joined next week um, by uh, CSSW alumna Cynthia Roy, founder and CEO of Regional Hospice, to discuss current trends in hospice care. So thanks very much for joining us today. Have a great week, and we'll see you all next week. Bye.